Hello and welcome to episode 171 of Page One, the Writers Podcast. I'm Tarek. I'm Marco, and thanks for joining us on the podcast where we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, find out how they got into the industry, and try and get as many hints and tips from them as possible. And uh, we've got a great back catalogue of guests, so please do check that out if you haven't already. But this week we're joined by, I think it's fair to say, probably a, a, a real legend of the of the writing scene. Yeah, absolutely. We are chatting with the fantastic Dean Kuntz, who, as Marco said, legend is probably the right word to use for him. I mean, I think we calculated he'd written over 120 novels, Yeah, um, starting way back in 68 with Star Quest, I believe, his first novel, kind of sci-fi route. And then, I mean, everyone knows who Dean Kuntz is. He's written countless books. He's written sci-fi, horror, suspense novels, you know, lots of twisty stuff. I always think of him as same genre as Stephen King when I was growing up though they were writing those similar types of kind of small town horror you know suspense yeah. novels yeah I, and and I always associate him with with the twist you know I mm-hmm. think he's he's very yeah. good at that sort of thing and we talk about that actually in the in the chat and also yeah talked about you know how he how he's managed to sustain <laughs> his his will to write to write over 120 novels um yeah. So it's a really interesting chat with, as we say, a legend, legendary author. Uh, really honoured that they came on to the podcast to chat with us. Um, so we'll get straight into it after a quick advert for our writer's notebook, and then we'll be back at the end with a bit more chat about next week's guest. But for now, on with the podcast. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project. Whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story, we truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, Every story starts with page one. Did you always want to be a writer? Uh, When I was eight years old, I was writing stories on tablet paper, drawing a little cover and making booklets out of them, peddling them to relatives or a nickel. Uh, So I was publisher, writer, editor, uh, agent. I was the entire spectrum <laughs> of publishing. And uh, for years, I didn't know where that came from, except that it was around that time that books became an escape for me from a house that was always in turmoil and not a pleasant place to live. So I wanted to get out of that. And for some reason, books were the most obvious way for me to do it. Uh, and, but I never thought of it as a way to earn a living or as a career until I was in college. And, uh, and then it wasn't anything college taught me. It was that uh, a professor submitted a story of mine to a nationwide contest and it won a prize. Wow. Uh, and suddenly that was recognition. 
and uh, I'd never had any kind of recognition as a kid. So uh, I was sold, and that's sort of where I really decided this was what I was going to do. Um, and I'm I'm right in saying that you you continue to 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 write in your spare time after college. You were an English teacher, and and then you wrote, and I think Star Quest was the first novel that you that you put out in 1968. Um, and I and I wanted to ask you about writing that first novel. You know, um, was that the first novel you'd actually written, or had there been other novels that you'd written before that just didn't get anywhere before StarQuest did? Uh, when I was in college, I tried to write a novel and uh, got part of the way uh, through it and then went no further. Uh, StarQuest was the first one I published. I would published a number of short stories uh, and a number that I'd written that nobody wanted. Uh, but the, the first novel, StarQuest, was... Uh, was taken by Ace Books. They published uh, two science fiction novels in one volume. And if you flip the book over, there was another cover on the back for the other novel. Okay. And uh, so it wasn't much money then. It was uh, $1,500 they offered. What's well, more then than now? They offered for a novel. But when they bought mine, they said, this is too short. Uh, so we can't pay, we'll publish it, but we can't pay you the full 1500. We'll pay you 1250 because we'll have to pay the author on the other half of the book <laughs> more money. Years later, I met that other author and I said to him, because of you, I got paid less for my first novel. He gave me the strangest look and said, no, because of you, I got paid less. <laughs> uh, your novel was longer than mine. That was my first introduction to what publishers can do for <laughs> yeah. you. I see that. And and was that something that came around, you know, back then, was it just a straight approach to the publisher that you had done there without an agent or anything? Yeah, I think I sold my first three or four not paperback novels without an agent. Uh, and then I got a crooked agent. <laughs> that was a couple of years of nightmare. And then I got a better agent after that. Uh, but initially, no, I had no agent. Now, these days, I think it's much harder, at least in the U.S., to get published without an agent because the over the transom submissions that they used to hire people to read, I don't think they hire anyone to read those anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and you were, I think that I'm right in saying that you were only 23 when, when Star Case, StarQuest uh, came out. Um, you know, how, how did it feel to have something published albeit maybe not not getting paid what, what you should have done <laughs> but um how did it feel to have that published at, at that age well i grew up reading almost exclusively science fiction robert heinlein's uh, young adult novels and then much else so to have one published in that field when i was 23 was very exciting until you found out how few people ever saw it because it was in a <laughs> line that sold regularly but not vast quantities uh, and it, it was nevertheless a confirmation of something i sometimes say if i had just called it star trek not star quest <laughs> i'd have been famous much quicker so close and yet so far <laughs> um and, and and after that i find it we, quite interesting looking when you look over your over your catalog of of novels and you've and you've written i think over 120 novels i read which is just insane um, you you kind of genre hop quite quite well. You know, Star Quest was a sci-fi novel, but then you very quickly went on to do horror suspense novels after that. And and I wondered why that initial kind of pivot from sci-fi into horror suspense was that something? Did you always want to write in that genre? Was it was it just a kind of interesting? Can I do this? Can I change things up a little bit? What, what was the thinking there? I think it was a confluence of certain things. One. Uh, I wrote quite a few science fiction novels, and I realized at some point that while I loved this form as a reader, I was no good at it as a writer. A couple of the things I wrote were fine, but a lot of them were third rate. And I just didn't have the knack for that as a writer. Uh, so in the meantime, I'd begun reading in other fields more than I had as a, as a child. And I like suspense novels, although the first thing I wrote 
outside of the field was a comic novel that was very well revered, but didn't sell. And uh, my agent at that time said, well, it's not thing to do with your novel. The critics loved it, but comic novels simply don't sell. And I thought, well, why didn't somebody tell me that before <laughs> I wrote one? Uh, and uh, so for years, I didn't include any humor in novels because there was so much advice against it. And then I later, with books like Lightning and so forth, started to introduce a little element of that into it. When I first started crossing genres, U.S. publishers were not accustomed to that. And there were many terrifying struggles where I thought my career was over because the publisher who had been published would say, I can't publish this. Why? Because it has humor in it or because it's two genres or three uh, and nobody will know what it is. And that was a wall that I hit over and over again after, after I had bought back all my science fiction novels in order to get rid of the science fiction label. Mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly I was having trouble with other publishers because they didn't like the cross genre approach. I mean that that's something that actually we've heard from from authors being published now as well. It just seems that publishers are very uh, conservative, I guess, uh, with their approach. They they want it to fit in an easy space on a particular bookshelf, and if it does more than that, they don't like it. Except when it suddenly becomes a hit, and then suddenly they want lots of books like that. <laughs> yes, I uh, I can remember. Nobody published military fiction because nobody bought it until Tom Clancy had this enormous success. Yeah. And then half of everything in the bookstore was military novels. Uh, that is something uh, I talk to young writers about sometimes uh, because they're so anxious to get published. They, they scope the market. They put up the periscope and look around and note what's selling. And that's what they think they should write. And I always tell them, if that's what you're going to do, you will be, you, let's say you get established. Let's say you, they buy several of those zombie novels you wrote. By the time you've written five of them, they won't want any more zombie novels because something else will be hot. And meanwhile, they will now call you a zombie novel writer and they won't want to let you publish anything else. So mm -hmm. it's it's best to publish what you love and stay with it. And... And you were writing, I mean, I think I read you were writing eight books a year at one point. Um, and I know some of them were under pseudonyms, but that's just, I mean, that's a crazy number of books. I mean, how did you manage to write so many books a year at that point? Well, now this is my very early years. I, I'm fortunate now if I write one or two a year, I am doing two a year now. Uh, that was back in the days when paperbacks were about 60,000 words long which is not a terribly long novel. And uh, uh, in order to put food on that table, because my wife and I were married with uh, 1500 well, $150 and a used car and our jobs. So we didn't have anything. And when I started to write full time, uh, my wife said, I'll support us while you try to do this. So money was an issue. And in those days, you could start as a writer. I was that's when I was working in science fiction. I was writing these shorter novels, and then there were uh, gothic novels. So were, they were an equivalent of women's romance novels of now, except they were always set in some earlier age, and they were very formulaic. And I had an editor who said, "I think you can write these." As I said, "I have no interest in writing them," and he said, "Well." we'll pay you $3,500 per title, which seemed a fortune in those days. Mm -hmm. And my first thought was, I do these under a pen name. I make that much money, more than I'm making for things I'm writing under my name. It'll allow me to build up a cushion to make this change I wanted to change. So there were a couple of years where, yes, I wrote that many novels, but they were formulaic novels. They were all were similar in plot in character, and that's what that kind of genre wanted. I've kept them all out of print, so we we don't acknowledge those books <laughs> for the past, past century. Um, but presumably all of that helped lay the groundwork for you to write the novels that you actually wanted to write at, at, at that point then. 
Yeah, it's exactly the case. I knew many uh, writers who their, their way of trying to get it to the point where they could earn a living was to hold a real job uh, and, uh, and then write in their spare time. Mm -hmm. And I could see that that might not work very well, uh, that uh, you better enjoy that job, you that real job you've got, uh, because that's liable to be what you're stuck at if you're not able to devote yourself entirely uh, to the novel writing. So I just chose that route. And it allowed me then to make that switch and eventually to take much more time to write. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and it worked out well. But again, even after I bought back the rights to all those science fiction novels, in many cases, I paid the publisher as much as they had paid me mm -hmm. to buy the rights back. Uh, and even after I'd done that, as long as 15 years later, 15 years since I had written a science fiction novel, and all of them were out of print, uh, except maybe being in the same. I could still publish a new book, and the, uh, some reviewers would say, well, here's something different from the science fiction writer. <laughs> and it would make me crazy that it took that long to wash out the other reputation yeah. and move on. Um, so, so what's your routine like now then? You know, do you... Do you? I think I read that you write six days a week, you know, all day long, pretty much. And is that has that changed much since you were younger? I mean, you know, obviously back then you're writing eight books a, a year. Now you're doing one or two. But is your routine the same? Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I uh, I'm very fortunate in once I was writing something I was better at, and something that I I wanted to get still better at and and learn and practice. Uh, throughout the career. Then it was done out of more love, perhaps, than it had been done before. And it's very fortunate, fortunate I can say this, uh, when I'm working, it's hard work writing and trying to write well. But it's also a form of play, uh, if you love it. And so it isn't like having to go to work in a supermarket every day or in an engineering position or whatever, neither one I'd be capable of. But uh, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's not as much hard work as it looks to people that say, you're working 60 and 70 hours a week and you're this far past retirement, you're still doing it. Yes, because I don't know what else I do. Uh, I'm not big into sports. Uh, and, uh, I drive by a golf course now and then and say to my wife, that looks like a pleasant way to spend some time. And she just starts laughing. <laughs> uh, she knows I'm the kind of personality that will break a set of golf clubs every week in my frustration. <laughs> um, so it, it's something I love to do. And I'm still finding after all these years that there are infinite ways of approaching a story and characters and that there's many things I've never done before. So I keep trying to do something new, which frustrates the hell out of publishers sometimes. But that's what keeps you interested and fresh. Absolutely. And and with your stories, are you someone that likes to sort of plan or outline them before you start writing? Or do you just have the idea and, and start writing and see where it takes you? Uh Back in the day, I would write outlines uh, because I had reached a point where um, publishers would buy the outline, and pay me half the advance, and then I would write the book. But I got endlessly frustrated because as I wrote the book, uh, new ideas would come to me, new things that weren't in the outline. And they were tantalizing, they were interesting, they were better than what was in the outline. And so I finished the book I'd feel very much that it was a much better book than they bought. And they wouldn't always like it because it wasn't the book they bought. Uh, they were so used to, they waited a year to receive this. And now they saw it was somewhat different. And uh, there was resistance. And I finally said, with Strangers, which was my first hardcover bestseller, I'm not going to do outlines anymore. And that book had a very large cast. It was about 300,000 words. And I found that I really enjoyed creating the characters and letting them tell me where the story would go. 
And I've never done an outline since. Uh, all the rest of the novels are start with characters that you find intriguing in a situation that you find intriguing and just see where it's going to take you. Mm -hmm. uh, it also keeps me interested because I'm always surprised when mm -hmm. a character does something I'm not expecting. And I think, wait, that's not the right way to go. I've learned to trust it. Some would say it's your subconscious working, which is smarter than your conscience. Or I say it really is like you give the characters free will. And when they become people more than people on paper, but real people in their way, then they go places you don't anticipate. Yeah, if, you know, speaking personally, when you're writing something, I feel that you you know it's it, you're doing something right when that sort of thing happens, when your characters are suddenly doing something that you didn't expect in a way because they've sort of embodied themselves on the page uh, in a way that is that they're able to go and do that rather than sort of following a strict bullet point outline or something like that, I guess. Yeah, but as soon as you start, I think... From my experience anyway, different strokes for different folks, as they say. But from my experience, uh, if I were to do a chart of character traits and plot points, then I'm frozen in some degree to that approach. And I'm not open to the organic story. And the organic story is always going to be more interesting than the one you plotted out in, in beforehand. And do you find that when you're when you're pantsing like that and you're kind of just seeing where the characters take you and where the, where the story goes, do you find that that has a knock-on effect in the editing process, that it takes longer to edit because you're, or, or, or you get to a point later on in the book where you think, oh, I need to set this up more, so I need to go back and tweak that. You know, do, does that have an impact on the edit process for you? Well, now we get to a very strange way I work. <laughs> I've heard of a couple of other writers who work the same way, but most don't I do not write a draft and then go back. I I've suffered from so much self-doubt over the years from the time I was a child uh, that the way I am forced to write is I revise the first page over and over until I can't make it move any faster. I can't make the prose any smoother. I can't make it any more enchanting. That might be 20 times that I write that page. Uh, maybe 10, if I'm fortunate. Then I go on to page two, and the self-doubt comes back, and I go through the whole process again. At the end of every chapter, I pencil, I print it out and pencil it up probably three times, because you see things on a printout you don't see on the mm -hmm. screen, mm -hmm. or at least I do. And, uh, and then I pencil it. At the end of the chapter, that chapter is as close to perfect as I can make it. Now, sometimes you get later in the book and something comes up that you weren't anticipating and I have to go back and plant an event. Uh, yes, that sort of thing happens, but not very much and not very often. Uh, I've sometimes they, someone will say to me, but how do you keep the momentum of the story? And I found that slowing yourself down doesn't disturb the momentum at all. And in fact, it may enhance it because you're forced to go. I force myself to go through that prose over and over, trim it, tighten it, find the best way to say it. And that is momentum and action. Um, and also the benefit of working that way for me is I, whenever you're writing something and the characters are moving it along, and you're sort of following them the half step behind. At some point, you know, as the stories develop, you think, uh-oh, this is going to be a problem because you do see a little bit ahead mm -hmm. and you may see 40, 50 pages down the road, some issue that's going to come up and there's going to be a problem of how do you get past that because of what you've written, what is a logical explanation or a logical thing for these characters to do. And you may be stumped, I may be stumped to think of it until I get there. And in the meantime, because of the pace at which I'm writing, which is so slow, really, uh, my subconscious has come up with sometimes three or four answers and I get to pick the best one. If I wrote a quick draft, I don't think that would happen. Yeah. And I think once it would be on the page, I'd be tempted not 
to go back in another graph to make major changes. So by the time I get to the end of the book, uh, I'm ready to send it to the editor, copy editor, well, the editor first, and see what they say. So uh, it's, I think for a lot of people, it'd be a frustrating way to work. For me, it's it's a deeply involving way to work, and I really like it. So I'm at this point in my life, I couldn't work any other way. Yeah. And, and what about things when you do pass it to the editor and the do they come back with with lots of notes or you know has that changed through the career you know at this stage of your career are you getting less notes than you did earlier on and things like that ever since i started working this way without an outline and with uh this sort of very methodical way of going through the script i don't get any serious editorial notes if i do get something that i think hey, that's a cool idea. I take it and fold it in because after all, when the book's published, it doesn't say by Dean Koontz with brilliant ideas by yeah. and the other name under it. So if I can snatch a good idea from the editor, I will shamelessly do so and expand <laughs> upon it. Uh, I've had copy editors tell me I'm trying to put them out of business, uh, but that's just a function of going over the script so many times and seeing that small things that you might have missed otherwise. And, and you know, uh, Tarek alluded to the number of books that, you, that you've written over your career. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, um, I suppose, common question that writers get, where do you get your ideas from? But I mean, how how does an idea form in your head? How does it, what is the thing that says that's going to be the next story that I'm going to explore? It's... Uh... When ideas come to you from so many directions that, uh, and sometimes you have no idea where it came from. Uh, uh, people assume you get your ideas from dreams, which I find uh, very strange, actually, considering my dreams. Uh, but I did get one or two novels from a dream. Uh, I woke up one in the middle of the night, and the whole idea of the novel Innocence was in my head. And I couldn't wait to get that novel written because I knew uh, very much the voice in which it would go. Uh, other times, I, I was coming home from a, a studio meeting in LA on a film project, and I was in a bad mood, which you always are when you come out of the studio meeting. And I was in my wife's SUV, and she had a uh, tape deck on or a, a CD deck that was Simon and Garfunkel and Paul Simon. I'm a big Paul Simon fan, so was she. And uh, I was listening to that, grumbling to myself. And this song came on called Patterns. And I, I know all of Paul Simon that can sing it all along, although people would pay me not to sing it. Uh, and uh, in Patterns, there was this line I'd heard a thousand times that meant nothing to me. And all of a sudden, it was a novel idea. The line was, my life is made of patterns that can scarcely be controlled. And that gave me the idea for a novel called Life Expectancy, which is a suspense novel, but a comic novel also. And uh, so sometimes I, I'm i surprised where the, the idea comes from. And then sometimes it actually spooks me out when I get a novel idea that I cannot trace back any inspiration at all. It, it moments like that, it almost seems like you're a conduit to some other power that's sending you what you're going to write. Uh, and then I think of Elon Musk saying we all may be in a game simulation. Yeah. I don't think he's correct, but uh, uh, and uh, you know, on the, on the um, process as well. Your novels are a lot of your novels are very famous for you know for having good twists and things like that which when we've spoken to other writers something like that is something that they need to plan ahead for so that they can lay the seeds of it earlier on and things like that i mean are these things that come to you as you're writing it or sometimes do you have the idea for a twist and then work the story around that you know nobody's asked me that before and there aren't any questions i haven't been asked but that's a, that's very interesting because you just made me realize something no i don't generally 
think of a twist and then have to go back and plan it. Interestingly enough, those twists that come up suddenly strike me. They, they generally come out of the situation, the character, who the characters are and some traits of those characters and from things that have happened and how they've reacted to them. And I suddenly it dawns on me, this would be a very logical thing for this character to do, whether it's the villain or uh, the uh, protagonist. Uh, so those things tend to come out of the character and what's happened up to this point. And then what suddenly seems, wow, that would be an amazing development, really flows out of what I've already written and getting to the point of recognizing the potential of it. Um, I wanted to ask about about Whispers, which was um, your novel, which came out in 1980, I think it was. And it's a novel that you've described in interviews as your breakthrough novel. Um, and I mean, at this point in your career, you've been writing for over 10 years. You know, you'd had a number of novels out already. And I wondered what it was in your view, why you think whispers connected with audiences in a way that your previous books didn't? Yeah, I was at a point in my career then when I was trying to understand why some books grab a larger audience you know, and some wouldn't. And, you know, the cynical answer is, well, is, is the answer that publishers actually would tell me. Uh, I was being told even back then, your vocabulary is too large. You have to write within a 500 to 600 word vocabulary. Uh, your plots are too complex. You have to write something that's simple in its fundamental nature. And I always thought that came out of a disrespect for the reader. Uh, and I never bought into that. I, I always thought a lot of publishing, common wisdom in publishing is very common, but it isn't wisdom. And uh, I resisted that because the mail I would get from readers was articulate and interesting. And I knew those readers were out there. Uh, and yet I, I would see that much of what was published, some of it was very simple, uh, written in a vocabulary for eighth or ninth grade, if you want to think of that way. Uh, but I always resisted that. <clears throat> and then I think it was with whispers that I began to see that uh, a certain kind of complexity can lead to all kinds of surprises within a story. It's harder to, you know, uh, Whisper has a couple of major twists in it. It's kind of hard to write a twist in that's convincing and interesting if the story itself isn't complex enough to carry that twist. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I began to understand that, I started to write novels that were broader in scope and somewhat deeper in character. Uh, and it was out of that understanding that I quickly moved to, I was still fumbling with it. I would probably look back at Whispers now and, and grimace all the way through the book. Uh, but at the time, it was different than anything I'd written. And it was recognized by most of the people I was working with at the time that it was something that could reach a bigger audience. My hardcover publisher did not think so. But there was competition for the paperback, and it was the first book I ever had that sold a million copies in paperback. And then I moved on to things like Phantoms, which is more directly a horror novel, uh, because that's what the publisher insisted I read. And I had a lot of fun with that novel. Uh, and but it was in a, it was a novel in the process of getting to books like Strangers, Watchers, and Lightning that became in their scope, uh, not just longer and not just more complex in their storytelling or in the depth of character, but also in the issues they dealt with. Uh, I always say uh, when young writer, uh, at my age, everybody's a young writer. Uh, it's, uh, you, know, I, you need to think what the book is about on the subtextual level. Not just what the plot is about, not just what the characters are about, but does this book have anything to say about the human condition? Is there any overall thing that uh, we would say is that, to use a literary class term, what is the theme of this book? Uh, 
and books will have more than one theme. That's sometimes various themes not brought together. And there are issues about the human condition you find yourself writing about. If you've never thought about that, it's one way to think about writing a novel that moves it into a category that some people in publishing will see as more, more broadly, more appealing to a broader audience. Mm -hmm. And it isn't that that audience will consciously say, well, that was a cool idea about human suffering or something else. It's just that they won't feel that, that greater complexity of the story and that greater depth. And that leads to greater sales in my experience, I think. And that's why in a way whispers was something of a breakthrough. And and uh, moving right up to date, your your most recent book is After Death, which uh, I think uh, as we record this, it comes out tomorrow, certainly in the UK. Do you, do you want to tell us a little bit about that one? Well, now that one, I can tell you where the idea came from, uh, because for years I've been reading about what expectations all the techies of the world have for the singularity. Uh, there's various subtle shades of difference in the definition of singularity, but basically the moment where humanity and machine come together at, at a great improvement to human life and intelligence and all that. And I read uh, Ray Kurzweil and people like that talking about it, and I've read and read about it over the years, never thinking I'm reading this to come up with a novel. But one day I just got kind of tired of the, the, the whole idea that this will overnight improve the human species into what we're all astonishingly intelligent and uh, and capable. And I would, when I got to the point where I read, this could increase human intelligence overnight by a hundred times current, a thousand times. I thought, hmm, that really doesn't, I just no understanding of human nature in that comment. We are not going to be human if that happens to us. But secondly, it ain't going to happen to us. We don't have the synapses, and our skull would have to be about four times larger. That takes some time to develop in the species. Uh, and, but that, that made me think, okay, a lot of this is fantasy and wishful thinking. But what if some place was doing an experiment in uh, using machine learning and trying to find through nanotechnology or some biology related to it. I chose to talk about Arcadia, which are a form of, used to be thought of as bacteria, but they're not, which can transfer genetic material between species and does so in nature all the time. So I thought, what about that? That's some experiment with this and to an extent, it works, uh, and, but it kills everybody uh, involved in the project, except one guy wakes up after he's dead and uh, and walks out of the lab. And is he a superman now? Is he super intelligent? No, he's not super intelligent. Uh, he doesn't have any superpowers. He isn't going to live forever, ever, which is another thing they believe the singularity will bring us. Uh, uh, he can still be killed, but there's one thing it has left him with, one ability, and it's an interesting thing uh, that he's able to do. And with that one thing, what would be his advantages in a, in a story of sort of high action and excitement? And that's that's where the idea came from, and it was a lot of fun to explore. It, well, I was just going to ask that. I mean, it, it, you know, it, is, it sounds like a, a great book and a, an exciting story to read. And do you still, I take it you do because you're still writing, but do you still get that same buzz, that same excitement when you're when you're exploring ideas like that with your stories? Uh, yeah, my one of the trials my wife goes through is at the end of the day, at dinner, if something quite exciting happened in the story, I can babble on about it a considerable way. <laughs> Uh, but she's she's very good about that. Uh, yeah, I don't think the excitement level, you know what excites you changes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited if I get a, a paragraph beautifully written with metaphor simile that really work. Uh, I'm excited about turns in the story that 
deepen the story or uh, turns in a character that I didn't see coming and what that means to the character and, and, and what emotion that uh, will bring to the novel to give it some greater depth. Uh, I still have as much fun at the keyboard as I ever had. Uh, and I would say maybe more. Um, your standards get higher, at least mine did as the years went by. That means you're raising the bar and it's much easier to fail. And there's something about being determined not to fail and and to get this done in the right way that it is it's very exciting i don't know that a lot of people don't love to write to find it exciting but for those of us caught who've caught this bug that's an exciting thing that never stops and i think though it's important that you build a career that allows you to write anything you want uh, <clears throat> that if you do stick with one character for 40 novels or you stay within one narrow genre, I think you would become bored with it yeah. uh, long before this. Uh, I'm very fortunate at this point in my career to be with a publisher, <clears throat> and this is the first I've ever had, never says to me, you can't push these two genres together. I've never seen something like this done before. This is a narrative technique that, uh, that you can't use because no one will understand it. It's, it's very liberating to be somewhere where they want to see you do whatever you want to do. And since I never really had that before, uh, that may be one reason I still want to get to work as early as I do every day. And and the publisher there that you're talking about, am, am I right in saying that's 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 Thomas and Mercer with Amazon, who you, you've usually signed a, a five-book deal with, I think, it, yeah, I've, yeah, I'm just completing a second five-book deal. Uh, when I decided I had to leave Random House, I owed them two novels, so I paid them back what I had been paid to that point. And I had done stories for Amazon Original Stories mm -hmm. uh, in a series called Nameless. And uh, they their hope was that their prime customers would take uh, a million uh, sets of the nameless stories in the first year and instead i think it was something like three million times the stories wow. were downloaded really? so we did six more but i had never done novels with them. and my agent said we want to put thomas and mercer in the mix when we go out to all the other publishers to get a deal and my first thought was oh, i don't know about that because that means you have to understand how much Amazon is sort of hated by the publishing industry. Uh, and there's a lot of bookstores that won't carry Amazon published mm -hmm. books. Uh, there is a lot of review places that will not review them. Uh, and I probably won't get a bestseller of this anymore, no matter what we sell, because they don't count Amazon sales. But Amazon sells 60% of all books. Uh, and or it won't count books Amazon itself publishes mm -hmm. in its very sense. But I I had been 14 years without an agent because I had had such bad experiences. I had agented myself and had started that. So I went with an agent a few years ago and I liked them and they were uh, exceeding capable. So I said, well, if you think we should put Thomas and Mercer in, let's do it. We ended up with eight offers, every New York publisher and every was told, I need to see a marketing plan along with a financial office offer. We got eight offers. Thomas and Mercer was one. They were equal to the best offers otherwise, and all were pretty much close. Uh, but the difference was some New York publishers just deemed not to provide a marketing plan. And the best that anybody had provided out of New York was two pages. Uh, Thomas and Mercer produced 40 page marketing. Wow. <laughs> and I looked at the difference and said, you know what? I've always said what really matters most is how many readers you reach, mm -hmm. because it was books that changed my life. Uh, a kid in a poor house with a violent alcoholic father, never know if we had a roof over our heads. Books showed me a way out to a better life. And that's always in the back of my head. So you want to reach people. You want to touch lives. 
And to do that, I have to have somebody in the marketing that believes in what you're doing and wants to try to make it bigger. Uh, so I jumped in the water and went with Thomas and Mercer. And it, in many, many ways, has been the best decision I ever made. And That's it's nice. it's not to bore you with this. What's really interesting to me is in New York publishing, by the time somebody is a publisher, they're at least 50 some years old. They've moved up through the chain. There's always been publishers who are there till they're 70. So openings are slow to arrive. Uh, and you're dealing with an older group of people. When I went to Thomas and Mercer, the thing that stunned me most was that everyone I was working with was in their 30s or as no older than 41 or two. And it, very creative, uh, not tied into the old ways of doing things. And it was a totally different environment. And it's turned out for me anyway, a big great one. And do you think that's why they're more open to the sort of cross genre idea and things like that? That they they just have a different attitude to the sort of conventional publishing wisdom or not wisdom, as you said. Well, remember back to who said this was it Zuckerberg or whoever said the point of I tag or the point of our place in the market is move fast and break things. <laughs> And uh, that, of course, means create things that are better than what you broke. Uh, and there is some of that same attitude, I think, even in the publishing realm here. Uh, there's, you know, they have their ideas where you could have improved it and where maybe you went wrong with too many words in this chapter. But, uh, but you negotiate that or work that out or agree or disagree. And it goes, that usually goes pretty quickly, uh, a week for revision if that much and you move on. So there isn't these long protracted articles that are arguments in which you're dealing with somebody who says, I never saw this before, which means it can't be done. I'm just not seeing any of that now. Excellent. And and you've also written, uh, I think I want to quickly ask you about as well as novels and short stories, you, you've written a number of comic books as well. Um, how did you get involved in, in that world? Uh, some, well, at first it was uh, mangas, and I was per supposed to write it, by, which is a form I particularly think is appealing. And uh, I was supposed to write the story outlines, and a writer would come in and so forth. And I, I worked, we did, I think, four odd Thomas mangas uh and we're contracted to do something like eight and i've learned the hard way that uh, what the grade school teachers tried to tell my parents that i don't work well with others is absolutely true i don't uh, collaborate well and i would find myself getting a decent script for the autonomous manga or something and i would have to go in and fiddle with it and fiddle with it and change all the dialogue, uh, if not the story. And it finally was not worth my time. And when it was regular comic books, I said, no, I, I just can't be doing all this. I have to stay with the thing I most love, which is the books themselves, which is what ended up being my attitude toward film writing as well. I did that for many years, had a lot of projects greenlighted, uh, and eventually got so frustrated with the collaborative nature of a film that I couldn't handle it anymore. Personal shortcomings. I have many personal shortcomings. That's the one. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, it'll be it'll be novels from here on out. No no desire to go and revisit those those other forms then. No. I with what time I have left, I have too many novel ideas. I have a drawer full of ideas dating back fifty years. And I always when I get an idea that I'm and I don't have time to consider it now because I'm working on something else. I jot it down, throw it in a drawer, and say, I'll go back to that when no new ideas have come to me. Mm -hmm. I have a drawer full of those ideas that I've never had to finish in it. So uh, there's always new and better ideas coming. And I'm much happier if I just stay with the books. Excellent. <laughs> What was the last book that you read? Uh, I just 
uh, recently uh, uh, had to take a little break for a medical issue. And while I was doing a little recuperating, I thought, I'm going to go back and read John D. McDonald, who, when I first discovered John D. McDonald, uh, I read, uh, I think it was 34 novels in 30 days. Wow. It was all I did was read John D. McDonald for a month. And, uh, and I think it was John D. McDonald that taught me that character could be just as interesting as plot. And, uh, uh, and it was a master at character. And I wondered, I hadn't really reread any of McDonald in probably 30 years. And uh, I thought, well, I'm just going to pull off the shelf some of the ones that I most fondly remember and hold my breath and see whether uh, I still feel strongly about them. And so I read five of them uh, while I was going through that little bit of recuperation. And to my great delight and surprise, they were just as good as I remember. That's sort of the thing. I, these days I read a lot for research too. So reading new material, I don't quite get as much of that done as I used to. Mm. Um, what about the last film that you watched? What was that? Uh, well, I, you know, streaming is an interesting thing. There are now so many series and movies that appear on streaming, not theaters. And, and you get very excited about watching it. And then almost none of them are worth the time you put into watching them. Uh, so I don't even want to talk about the ones that I watched and wish I hadn't. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, certain things that were good, there's little TV series called Dead to Me that I find sort of quirkily enchanting. And uh, uh, the characters are, are pretty, pretty well done. And talk about twists, it's full of them. Uh, so that... I was kind of surprised to see this new Schwarzenegger series. Mm -hmm. Bar is kind of charming and, and works in a way I would have expected. Uh, the last film that I saw that I I really thought worked, worked. You know, I don't like movies that are bloody. Now, I know that will sound strange. People, <laughs> but I can't, I can't watch gory movies. Uh, Something like The Walking Dead, I can understand the appeal of it, but I can't go there. Uh, and if there's too much bloodshed, I can't go there. Uh, but my wife doesn't mind that at all. And she was telling me for quite a while, you have to watch these John Wick movies. And I said, there's no way in hell I'm watching these John Wick movies. And then not long ago, I broke down. I sat down and watched one of them and I said, okay, I can watch this because there's more going on here. There's the huge amount of killing and bloodshed, but it's all the strangest kind of uh, films. And it has its own charm. Uh, it's an odd word to use for them. And that was the last thing I thought uh, I'd seen that was kind of intriguingly different. I haven't seen the fourth. I imagine at some point this thing will burn itself out because you can only do one thing so much, but it, it's uh, it's something uh, I was surprised to find worth watching. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the John Wick movies. I haven't seen the fourth one myself, but yeah, the first year, I know exactly what you mean, that kind of their own little universe to kind of carve out and their kind of own little rules that they play by and stuff, and it's, it's, it's very fun. Yeah. Um, and the the very, very last thing we always end up on is a, is a super quick fire, either or, and... Um, I'd like to say there's no right answer here apart from one, but we'll leave that one to the end and we'll start off with um, horror or sci-fi. Uh, that's that's hard because the genre's mixed, I would say. Mm -hmm. Horror probably slightly ahead of sci-fi. Uh, TV or cinema? I prefer cinema, but it's harder and harder to go that route. Uh, night Owl or Early Bird? I was a Night Owl in my youth. I'm an Early Bird now. <laughs> uh, music or no music when you're writing? Usually music, but it has to be something I've heard a hundred times so that I am uh, not distracted. And the last one, real book or ebook? 
I still prefer real books. And one reason I went to Thomas Mercer, they, they do decorative end papers, they do illustrations for the part breaks. The books are well bound. They're better produced than your publisher's books. Uh, so that makes me happy because I'm a rabid book collector. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> nice. Well, thanks very much to Dean for coming on to the podcast. As I said at the start, it really is an honour to get someone like him on this podcast. Yeah. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting when you were asking him about Whispers being his breakthrough novel and what he was saying about the attitude of publishers sort of telling him to dumb his books down, essentially. And that's why his books hadn't been selling well until that point, which, you know, I'm gl- fortunately, he, he took the opposite view and realised that readers want in-depth, you know, slightly complicated plots to, to get their teeth into. And that, as he says, is when you get good stories with good twists and things like that, you yeah. don't get that in, in plots that are too simple, etc. Yeah, and I think it just shows as well that, you know, like so many other folk have told us before, that it's a, it's a conversation with the publisher. It's a two-way street. You know, it's easy to say to yourself, well, I just have to do what they say when it comes to what you should be writing or how it's going to be marketed. But, you know ideally it is a bit of back and forth and obviously the bigger you are the more sway you've got etc but i think you know playing to each other's strengths is important and knowing when to agree with someone and when not to when to push back is really key as well yeah and he's obviously someone that you know keeps up to date with what's happening in the publishing industry and tries to yeah. work out you know the base path for his own books uh, quite rightly and i thought it was interesting what you're saying about thomas and mercy you know the, there was a lot of interest from sort of traditional publishers if you like uh, as well as thomas and mercer but it was only really them that came back with a proper marketing strategy for his book and as he says the most important thing if you're an author is to get the book read by people so you want yeah, someone that's absolutely. going to you know maximize the chance of that so um i thought that was pretty encouraging from i know uh, you know as he said there amazon get a, a bad rep and some of it is is very justified but they have also done a lot of good for the publishing industry as well as, as bad yeah, so yeah, um uh, there is a balance to be struck there and i think in his case it's, it's working well so um you can pick up after death now uh, so we'll put a link in the podcast description so you can get that or any of dean's other books and um, but we have next week we've got one of our very rare returning guests I know, I think it's only the second time we've had a return guest, which shows the first time was the great M.R. Carey, so this mm-hmm. is obviously a, an honour to see Lauren Lauren Bucus return to the podcast, uh, who is, of course, the author of The Shining Girls, uh, a wonderful time-travelling serial killer novel that was recently turned into the Apple TV show, and her latest novel is Bridge, which is uh, already out in the US, out in uh, 17th of August, tomorrow, at time of recording, here in the UK. And, uh, and yeah, it's great to come for her to, to come back and chat to and we And we have a really, really wide-ranging, interesting chat about the literary scene in South Africa, how that's changed, you know, the stuff like African futurism, what is that, how she defines it, what the, the future holds for, for parts yeah, of the world. Yeah, and, and chat, chat about AI. And so it's, it's obviously mm-hmm. because Lauren's been on before, uh, we've, we've chatted to her about her writing process before. We do chat to her about, you know, how, what she went through in terms of writing Bridge and things like that. But yeah, it's a, it's a bit more of a wide ranging chat than we might, we might normally have, but it's always great to, when an author wants to come back on the podcast and, and chat with yeah. us again so um yeah please do tune in for that one because it was a fun and interesting chat but if you enjoyed this week's episode please do take a minute to rate and review us on apple podcasts or your favorite podcast app as that helps us to continue to get great guests on the podcast and if you want to get in touch you can always do so by dropping us an email which is podcast at rightgear.co.uk, or you can go via the numerous social media sites that Marco spends his day monitoring. We are at UK Page One on all of them, apart from Mastodon. And on Mastodon, we are writing.exchange forward slash at page one pod. I could have made it easier by making this UK page one on that as well. <laughs> but, but you thought, no, I'm just <laughs> going to screw you. Make it difficult for Tarek somehow. For, um, for those four people on Mastodon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I do question 
whether it's worth <laughs> my my spending half an hour of refreshing posting so the same that. post on various different social media sites. But anyway, uh, we are there if you want to get in touch with us. Uh, but uh, otherwise, have a great week and we'll speak to you again next week. See you later. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.